Today's reading is taken from Hosea, chapters 4 and 5. Hosea, chapters 4 and 5. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no, no one contend, and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet shall also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed, on, they feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine, which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom, whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains, and burn offerings on the hills, on the oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters play the whore, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and the people without understanding shall come to ruin. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth Aven, and swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. Their rulers, and their rulers dearly love shame. A wind has wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Hear this, O priests. Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for the judgment is for you. For you have been a snare at Mizpah, and a net spread upon table. And the revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not permit them to, do to return to their God. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with them. With their flocks and herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them with their fields. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound the alarm at beth -Avon. We follow you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment among the tribes of Israel. I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move the landmark. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to go after filth. But I am like a moth to Ephraim, 
and like dry rot to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria, and sent to the great king, But he is not able to cure you, or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off, and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. How much does it matter what we're taught? How much does it matter what we're taught? And I do mean in church life here. How much does it matter what we're taught about God at Crossway? And look, I reckon to a certain extent, we'd all say it matters, right? That's why we're tuned in on a Sunday morning. But um, how much does it matter, let's say, uh, if my church teaches one thing, your church teaches another? How much do I care? How much do we need to talk about that, bring that up? Um, How much of a focus should Bible open time get as we gather together in our church life? How much time... Do we think that Jamie, that Sam, that Lizzie should be spending each week studying the Bible? How how much time would you feel comfortable hearing, excited hearing that our Bible study leaders spend each week preparing the passage that they're going to teach us on a Wednesday, Thursday? How much does it matter what we're taught? And I recognise that with an intro like that, what happens is um, for some of us, uh, perhaps those of us who have been in crossway type churches for many years, we just think, oh, yeah, good, 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 good. Another chance to remember that we're one of the Bible churches. We're one of the goodies. Let's have a go at the baddies. Can't wait for this one. And we just sit back and relax because we know it's not really about us. Um, This one's for everyone else. Um, Others of us, uh, others of us, well, we might be thinking, oh, no. Here Crossway goes again, another youngish guy telling us about the particular hobby horse of Bible, 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 we get it. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe many of us will have noticed that as we do gather together, actually we do give quite a lot of attention to the open your Bibles up to kind of um, ministry at Crossway instead of focusing on other things that maybe we grew up with in the churches uh, where we grew up. Perhaps we love it. Uh, Perhaps it's the very thing that keeps us coming back. Perhaps it's the reason that we made Crossway our church family home. Uh, Perhaps it's why we're joining in on Zoom. But we still might be left with the question, why? Why is it that here at Crossway uh, we try and put the Bible up front and centre in almost everything we do? And others of us, well... Um, others of us, or, or, or maybe many of us at various points, just wish that sometimes we could focus a, a little bit more on unity and a little bit less on, on the things we disagree with biblically uh, with other churches. You know, maybe um, if we could just talk a bit more about love uh, and a little bit less about doctrine and about orthodoxy. Or maybe there are those moments, uh, you know, those moments where you... You turn up at church and we're talking about judgment again, because that's the passage we're reading. Or, oh, no, it's one of those weeks on God's sexual ethic. And particularly on Zoom, particularly if we've uh, invited mates to tune in and listen, uh, we just think, oh, couldn't we have just talked about this a little less openly or a little less frequently? How much does it matter what we're taught? How much does it matter what we're taught about God from his word at Crossway? And I say after 16 years, I think 17, 18 years of being uh, in churches where I have been taught very clearly just how much it matters. I say after all of that, still for me, preparing this sermon, reading Hosea chapter four, I think I've been surprised by how strong God's answer is to that question. And the first point that we're going to see this morning, what we'll be spending a lot of our time dwelling on, chewing over, 
is chapter four, where God says that Israel's problem is coming from the pulpit. Israel's problem is coming from the pulpit. Have a look with me at chapter four, verse one. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. Even though the Lord God, Yahweh, has revealed himself to his people for centuries, through um, dramatic uh, gestures, through sweeping victories, through acts of judgment, uh, even though he has dwelt in their midst, in the tabernacle, in the temple, even though he sent them prophets, and I think above all else, even though he has left them his law, that is the first five books of the Bible, we refer to them as the Pentateuch, uh, the books that Moses wrote, even though Israel has had those for centuries, that they might be read out loud, that they might be those that know God, that they know what he is like and know what he likes, even though they have all of that, they've forgotten him. They've no knowledge of him. God, who's God? God's Baal. That's who God is. He looks like a bull and he wants us to go and have lots of sex so that he'll give us prosperity. What? Do you not know the living God? No, they don't. And so because they don't know him, they don't read his word, they don't know his law. And instead they do the opposite. Verse two, they're swearing, lying, murder, stealing and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. And then verse three, uh, God says in this um, picture that the punishment isn't just going to be for those who dwell in the land. But it's the whole land itself that's caught up in the pain of the consequences of their sin. Also, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, even the fish of the sea are taken away. Droughts, famines, invading armies. Even the wildlife is caught up in the devastation. And do you hear the echoes of Genesis? The beasts of the field, birds of the heaven, fish of the sea. I think God is reminding Israel, reminding us of that very first time in which Adam and Eve decided they were going to reject God's word. And as a result, not only they were punished, but all of creation too. And Israel is like that, rejecting God's word, punishment coming. Why? Why are they rejecting God's word? Why don't they care about it? Verse four to six, let no one contend, let none accuse for my contention. And for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day. The prophet also shall stumble with you by night. And I will destroy your mother, your mother Israel. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children, the future generations of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, the priests had two jobs or their one job had two parts. They, as we tend to talk about, were those who offered sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. But they also were those who taught God's law to the people. They and the prophets also who declared the words of God to the people. And so when the people go astray, when the people break the law of God, who is it that's supposed to accuse, contend? It's supposed to be the priest. But verse four, God says to them, shut up. Before you even begin to open your mouths to say what the people have done wrong, don't bother because my issue is with you. Verse six, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't know me. They will be destroyed. Why? Because you've rejected knowledge. You've forgotten the law of your God. It's not only that the priests aren't teaching the people the law of God. They themselves have forgotten it. They're not reading it. They're not bothered. And so they never mention him to the people. And so obviously the people don't know him. Verse eight. It is um, a brilliant, but also a nasty uh, image they feed on the sin of my people. You might have a footnote one there. 
um, sin or sin offering, same word in Hebrew. And quite literally, that is what the priests were told to do by God, to feed on the sin offering of the people. Um, so the priests were those who, as they're working in the temple, how does God provide for them so they get meat? Well, some of the sacrifice is burnt up and others of it, the priests eat. And they feed on the sin offering of my people, but they get a really um, good, uh, they, they, they start to get a taste for this. You know, oh, can we have a bit more sin offering, please? Or oh, can you sin a bit more and then offer some more? Oh, yeah. Oh, lovely. Mm, do you know what? It doesn't taste bad. Quite like the taste of this sin stuff. Oh, we'd love a bit more. Uh, they become greedy for the iniquity of their people. And, and I don't think God is talking literally about the fact that they're demanding more meat. No, uh, obviously what's going on is that the priests are also getting excited by the fact that the people are involved in living for self, uh, living for other things rather than God. Um, the people are excited by the sin of their people. And so when the punishment comes, verse nine, it shall be like people, like priest. I'll punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Last week we saw, didn't we, that um, God won't let his people who are pursuing idols, he won't let them to find satisfaction in those idols. And he repeats it here, this time to the priests as well. Greedy for iniquity, eat, 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 no satisfaction. Play the spiritual whore, but not multiply. Cherish whoredom wine and new wine. The priests are um, loving these parties, these religious parties that people are having where they're getting wasted and they're having sex to celebrate Baal when they should be encouraging people to turn back to God. And so instead, verse 12, people are talking to actual pieces of wood, statues, depending on them. And we talked last week about our folly, even though we think we're sophisticated, but but we depend on career. We depend on our financial security. These lifeless, um, inanimate ideas as though they can give us blessing. And the priests are encouraging this of the people. And it's not just the priests that are encouraging it. Verse 13 and 14. Um, the images of them sacrificing on, on the mountain tops, which is where they would go up to sacrifice to their false gods because their shade is good, or it just feels good to be there. It really feels like the right thing to do in the moment, uh, as they trust in something other than the living God. And as everyone is caught up in this uh, sexual um, practice of worshipping Baal, therefore your daughters, I think quite literally, play the whore, and your brides commit adultery. Betrothed couples, engaged couples, they uh, meet up at the temple one day. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, um, I'll see you again tomorrow night because we've got some more planning to do, haven't we, for the big day. Uh, what are you about to do now? And she turns to him and says, oh, I'm just uh, off to give Baal um, some of my sexual fertility. And she goes off and has a quick play. Or father, mother, daughter, it's Saturday. Uh, let's go up and worship on the hilltop. And they all go up and each goes their separate way. Uh, and the daughters maybe are the cultic prostitutes, while the father goes in to visit another cultic prostitute his daughter's age. Verse 13, your daughters play the whore, your brides commit adultery. But verse 14, God says, who do you think I'm going to blame? I'm not going to punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. What do you expect the daughter to be doing when her father, for years, has publicly spoken about his little trips off uh, to give of himself to Baal again, to serve God that he might himself might uh, get, get benefit, get blessing, aka I'm off to go and sleep with a prostitute. No, the father who should be about the work of teaching the law of God to his child is instead teaching her that in this house we go to Baal, where we get drunk, have sex, and he gives us blessing. And so in 15 to 19, God turns to the southern kingdom Judah and says, have nothing to do with northern kingdom Israel and her spiritual adultery. Verse 15, he actually starts by talking to Israel and he says, though you play the whore, let not Judah become guilty. 
And if Israel's up here and Judah is down here, these two towns, Gilgal and Beth Arben, they're on the border just before you hit um, Judah. And he says to Israel, enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Beth Arben. Don't go near them. Don't go near the border. And swear not as the Lord lives. Don't you dare pretend that you're serving me as you go down to my faithful people, Judah. Don't you dare pretend that you're serving Yahweh too. Let's all do it together so you can corrupt them with your wicked, um, idolatrous practices. We're all too aware of the ideas of contamination, um, of quarantine, self-isolation, aren't we, this year? And it's as though God is saying to Israel, um, quarantine yourself, stay away, do not infect Judah. And then he turns to Judah in verse 17. And he refers to the northern kingdom as Ephraim, because the biggest tribe in the north is Ephraim. And he says to Judah, he says, Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. They've given themselves to whoring. Even their rulers dearly love shame. They are so corrupt up there. Stay away from them. A wind has wrapped them in its wings. They're caught up in the whirlwind. But the whirlwind will become a tornado of judgment and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So Judah, please, my faithful people, don't go near them. Don't get infected. Israel's problem is coming from their metaphorical pulpit, uh, their priests, their prophets, uh, their fathers. And how much does it matter? How much does it matter what you're taught? Well, the end of verse 14, the end of verse 14 is chilling, isn't it? Because it's just a matter of fact statement of what will happen. It's not a threat. It's just reality. End of verse 14, a people without understanding, with no knowledge of God, shall come to ruin. How much does it matter what you're taught? A people without understanding shall come to ruin. And in the New Testament, we know that um, supremely the role of the priest is fulfilled by Jesus, our great high priest. He is the one who both sacrifices uh, himself on our behalf and he's also the one who teaches us the word of God. There is no knowledge of God. Well, God the Son comes down from heaven. We've been seeing that in John, haven't we? And we'll get there later uh, in this talk. But um, Jesus is the one who comes down from heaven who reveals God the Father, that we might know him. Jesus is the one who speaks the word of God to the people. But also in the New Testament, Jesus, as the chief shepherd, leaves under shepherds, pastors who teach the word of God on his behalf. How much does it matter that they teach us the word of God? A people without understanding shall come to ruin. And the implications are huge, aren't they? I was reading a terrifying YouGov uh, poll from 2014 in which 1,500 Church of England ministers were surveyed and 16% of them said they were unclear about God. 9% of them said it was impossible to imagine what God was like. 3% of them said they think that there is some spirit or force out there while 2% of them said that they thought that God is a human construct. They're in the pulpits. Uh, they are governing the teaching in those churches. And a people without understanding will come to ruin. And can I say, I do not say that glibly or lightly. This is not one of those ha 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 sermons. We're right, they're wrong. It's devastating what God is saying will happen in those scenarios. And I feel it too, the temptation, even as I teach the word of God this morning, you have no idea how often I long that I could just slightly change it, that I could not only myself be involved in living for other things and sinning, but also how often I want to encourage others in doing the same. I see it in myself. I am a weak, sinful human too. Many of us will have grown up, won't we, in, in churches where the Bible really does have a backseat in the life of the church. And we've probably seen some of the damaging effects of that. 
It's really worrying, isn't it? And I was thinking the reason it's so devastating is because if when I come to church, I don't hear the word of God, when I don't hear his truth taught, and so I don't know him, what else have I got in life? What else have I got to listen to apart from the siren calls of all the idols, the lies that I'm tempted to believe instead, that I'm bombarded with morning, noon and night? If I don't come to church and hear the truth, of course, instead, I'm going to follow the lies. And a people without understanding, well, they're led to ruin. And I was thinking, doesn't this uh, affect the way in which we pray? Pray for Jamie, for Sam, for Lizzie, for our Bible study leaders, if we're part of Crossway Church family. How often do we pray that they themselves would listen to the word of God, that they would love it, cherish it, that they might then teach it to us? Do we recognise that the temptation to live instead for other things is theirs as well as ours? Do we pray for protection for them, that we might be protected by the taught word of God? Do we pray for Sunday school leaders? Do we pray for ourselves as parents of children? And I was also thinking how exciting it is, how exciting that we get the privilege of sending someone like Portia off to Ghana so that she can raise up or be part of that work of raising up the next generation of Bible teachers, people who take God's word seriously and teach it to others. How incredible that we have the privilege in our church family of having people like Ross and Aislinn who have travelled the Atlantic so that they might be speaking to the people of East London the words of God, that they might know him. Israel's problem is coming from the pulpit. And our next point this morning is that Judah, uh, to Judah, Judah, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Chapter 5, uh, verse 1. And you can hear the desperation, can't you, in Hosea as he begs the people to just listen to the words of God. Hear this, O priests. Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for the judgment is for you. For you have been a snare at Mizpah and a net spread upon Tabor. And the revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. Speaking to the priests and the house of the king, he says, you've been a snare. You've been a net spread upon Mizpah and Tabor. They're high places where the people would go up to sacrifice, uh, maybe to Baal, maybe to the Lord, maybe to both. It's not quite clear, but they're going up and they're sacrificing away. They're slaughtering, slaughtering, slaughtering these animals because the priests and the king have told them to do it. But God Uh, looks at this great sacrifice slaughter of all the animals as the people cry out to the heavens, thinking they are appeasing God. But God looks down and far from being appeased, his anger is aroused. I will discipline all of them. And verse three and four, we're told that there's no going back for Israel, for Ephraim. Verse four, their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. They're too far gone in it. They're so caught up in this that there's no coming back for them. They'll never turn round. There's a spirit of whoredom within them and they don't know me. They don't know me. So even if they were to look around to try and find me, they wouldn't know where to begin. And then verse five, you get the horror of just who it is that's caught up in this. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with them. End of chapter four, stay away from Judah. Judah, do not become infected. But actually this strain of idolatry, this temptation, this tendency towards living for other things than God, it's so virulent that Judah's become infected too. And so the picture, verse six, is of them, Judah, going with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord. Let's go up to the temple to sacrifice to the Lord. 
but they will not find him, for he has withdrawn from them. So you see, if in verse 4 the problem is that they're too far gone, they're never coming back to the Lord, in verse 6 the problem is even if they were to come back to him, they're not going to find him because he's not there. And historically, uh, we've been talking the last few weeks about the fact that the punishment that's coming for Israel is Assyria. Big empire Assyria are going to come down, invade, take the territory, uh, destroy the Israelites and take the rest of them off into exile. End of northern kingdom Israel. But Judah too, Judah too has become infected and so they will also face the punishment of God. And what happens is as Assyria come down, they don't just stop at the border between Israel and Judah. They carry on down into Judah and they get even to Jerusalem itself and surround the capital, destroying all of northern Judah uh, before returning back up. And so you get a picture of that in verse eight, as all these border towns are mentioned. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, sound the alarm at Beth Arvon. We follow you, O Benjamin. Uh, Why are people screaming? Uh, We follow you, Benjamin. Help us. Why are they sounding the alarm? Because the invading army is coming down. They're in Judah now as well. Verse 9, Ephraim shall become a desolation, but verse 10, so too for the princes of Judah. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. This tidal wave, this tsunami of God's wrath coming down, 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 even into Judah itself. Ephraim, verse 12, God is like a moth to them, gnawing away. He's like dry rot to the house of Judah, slowly decaying the whole house. And verse 13, well, when they realise historically that they are not getting the blessing from Baal that they thought they should get, when Ephraim and Judah realise their sickness, you think obviously they turn to God, right? And they cry out to him for help. No, they turn to Assyria. Historically, what happens is Israel actually try and um, create an alliance with Assyria. Uh, before Assyria decides to attack them instead. They go to Assyria, to the great king, but he's not able to cure you. Of course he's not. He can't heal your wound. And you're thinking, right, of course he can't. It's God who can heal your wound. You've gone to the wrong doctor. That's why Assyria can't heal you. Only verse 14, the reason they can't heal you is because who it is who's attacked you. God will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away, I'll carry off, and no one shall rescue. I mean, it is a really, really bleak image, isn't it? Quite tough to swallow. But what God is saying is, of course, Assyria can't help you. I've decided to punish you. And um, what happens very quickly after Hosea is speaking these oracles is that within 100 years, All of this will take place and Assyria will carry northern kingdom Israel away. So if this makes sense, even though Hosea is speaking these oracles in the northern kingdom, actually, when all of them get put together in this book that we're reading and they get preserved for the people of God, it is actually southern kingdom Judah that has this prophecy that they're reading as part of the word of God for the centuries beyond. And so it is actually southern kingdom Judah who are going to be reading Hosea and remembering what happened in their history, how Israel did get taken away, as God said, how they were attacked by Assyria, as God said. And the lesson to them, well, it's clear, isn't it? Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Heed the warning. Make sure that you know me, Judah. Make sure that your priests, your rulers are teaching you the word of God. Only tragically, that isn't what happens at all uh, in Judah either. I mean, sometimes they get good priests, good rulers, good kings, but other times bad. Uh, And so actually, a hundred years after Israel gets taken into exile, so Judah does too. But then they come back from exile and the people who are reading the prophets like Hosea, well, they resolve that their priests are going to teach them the word of God. And so Ezra, he sits all the people down and he teaches them the law of God. 
but we see that within a generation, again, they have forgotten the word of God. And as we read the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, he again has to um, point the finger at the priests who are not teaching the people the word of God. You see, the problem is that the priests are as weak as you or I. They are just humans. They are prone to idolatry too. And as long as it depends on a human priest to be the solution to the problem, we're never going to learn the problem of history and we are doomed just like the people of Israel, the people of Judah. So what's the solution? Well, those of us who are part of Crossway and have been in John's Gospel this year in our Bible studies, we know the solution, don't we? The solution is that God will send his word into his world. The word becomes flesh. John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Jesus, God, the son. John 1, 14 the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so John 1 verse 18, no one's ever seen God, but the only God, God the Son, who's at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus, God the Son, has come into the world to reveal God the Father to a world that doesn't know him, to a people that reject his word. And gloriously we've seen in John, haven't we, that Jesus says that when he speaks God's word, he will enable his sheep to listen. Uh, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He will solve this problem of people not hearing God's voice by speaking it. He will solve the problem of them ignoring it, disobeying it by enabling them to obey it. Uh, how will they hear and obey? Well, we'll get there in the next few weeks, actually, in our Bible studies. Um, have a look out for that particular issue in John chapters 14 to 16. But let me just give you a short summary answer for the moment. The answer is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to give the Holy Spirit to his people so that they can know him, know his words and obey them. Jesus is the voice that we need to keep listening to if we are to know God, if we are to have understanding instead of coming to ruin. And because of him revealing himself, because him, because of him giving us the Holy Spirit, we are not doomed to repeat history. And so it is his words that we are to cherish, to dwell on, to mull on, to speak to one another at Crossway. It's his words that Jamie and Sam are to preach to us. When they are preaching to us, when I'm preaching, uh, we want to be checking what is being said and see whether it's in line with Jesus' gospel word. Because that is what matters, that we are taught his word. And I was thinking how privileged it is and how privileged we are, particularly in this century, in this country, to have so much access to the words of Jesus. I'm guessing that lots of us this morning, we haven't even opened up a physical Bible. We just have it on our app. We can just open up our phones and we have access to the words of Jesus, to the words of life that mean that we don't come to ruin. I was thinking, praise the Lord for how cheap Bibles are. I've probably got about five or six Bibles uh, on my bookshelves. That is how available the word of God is to us now. Praise the Lord for Bible studies that we have going through John's gospel this year, that we might hear the words of Jesus. And praise the Lord for the fact that we are in this kind of church family where so many people give up their time to study God's word, that they might teach it to us, that we have this culture where people just open up the Bible and read it with other people one-to-one. We've got about one-to-ones. What a glorious thing one-to-ones are. People just teaching other people the words of Jesus. Now, how incredible that at Crossway Kids, we know our children are being taught the words of Jesus, the words of God. It is the very reason why I know I have to go out to Italy, because there is a country where there are many, many pulpits where no one is teaching the word of God, where there are Bibles in everyone's home and almost no one is reading the word of God. I was thinking it's why Slovakia needs a Leah. It's why Chile needs the popes. And it's also um, the solution to our friends who might be in churches where they don't know the Lord or don't listen to the word of God. Actually, if they are people who have rejected it, what's the solution? We just open it with them, right? Because we now have the voice of the son of Jesus who reveals God the Father to his people. Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But God has broken into history. 
and he has spoken through his son. He's given us his spirit so that we don't have to be doomed like Israel. Why don't I lead us in prayer? Father, we really, really, really want to thank you for your son and for your spirit. Thank you that even though we are weak and we are prone to temptation and to idolatry, we won't face the same destruction uh, that Israel did. We won't be punished because your son has spoken and by his spirit, he has enabled us to hear his voice and to follow him. Please, 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 would you make Crossway into the kind of church where we are ever more careful to hear your son's voice, to listen to what you say and to know you better. And please, would that be our individual and collective uh, aim in life. And please, Father, through us, might you give us um, opportunities to bring others into relationship with you and help other believers, maybe from other churches, to hear you speak clearly uh, in your word. And we pray all of that in our glorious older brother's name. Amen.